Our speaker today is Sarah Timochko, who will be telling us about applications of topological time series analysis to hurricanes and dynamical, dynamical systems. Thanks, Teresa. Thank you, everyone, for being here and to the organizers for inviting me. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about, as Teresa said, two different applications uh, of using topological tools for time series analysis. So this is sort of two parts of the work that I did for my uh, dissertation research at Michigan State, um, looking at sort of changing structure in time using our topological tools. Oops. Okay. So Often when we talk about topological data analysis, we talk about how data has some sort of shape. And in certain contexts, the shape of data is more intuitive than others. So when we look at something like a hurricane, we can see it has this circular structure. It has a spiral pattern. Typically, we've probably all seen on the Weather Channel looking at you know, the hurricane spiraling as it moves over the ocean and towards land. So they are having a notion of shape is very visual, very intuitive. But in other cases, shape may not be as obvious. So in something like time series data, so here this is just a simple example where the x-axis represents time and the y-axis would be some measurement, whatever you're recording over time. Here, just as an example, it's just a noisy cosine wave. But the notion of shape is a little bit different. So we see hills and valleys, of course, in the time series, but it's not quite the same as looking at a, a circular shape in an image of a hurricane. But it turns out that there are tools from time series analysis and dynamical systems where we can take a one dimensional time series and embed it into a higher dimensional space. And so here, the color of the time series corresponds to the color of these points, where when we've embedded this time series into a higher dimensional space, we end up with this circular pattern in two dimensions. And so essentially what it comes down to is if we were moving through the time series, we're tracing out loops around this circular point cloud. So now we have a more visual intuitive idea of where there might be some topological features or circular features in time series data. So these are the sort of two different contexts of what I mean by looking at shape in data. So as I said, the first application is going to be towards hurricanes. And so we've all seen the sort of spiraling shape, but it turns out there are some underlying features, uh, which I'll explain in more detail in a bit how we get there. But if we look at how certain features of the hurricane change over time, here this is just a video showing changing uh, features in the hurricane, and we can see this sort of yellow pattern that appears and then spirals outwards over the course of time. So it uh, might be interesting to atmospheric scientists to know what these features uh, are doing and how they are changing over the course of time for a particular hurricane or in hurricanes in general. So the first application will be trying to detect those patterns uh, that we can see visually in that video, but using a more automated method than just watching videos. The second application will be if we're looking at time series data, we have a way to embed one time series into uh, that circular collection of points, as I showed. But what if we have another parameter? So what if we're running an experiment where we set a parameter and get a time series and then change the parameter a little bit and get a different time series? So that in some ways gives us a time series of time series where we have time in one dimension and some other parameter that we're changing in another. And so here, one example would just be changing the amplitude or maybe we're running some experiment that changes the amplitude of a time series. So how can we determine that it's still sort of the same features we're getting in the time series, but what's changing when we uh, tune some particular parameter. So those are the two uh, basic examples or two basic applications that I'll be talking about. So let's jump in and talk about hurricanes. Um, this, uh, at this point is, I don't know, a fairly old project, I guess, but we published it in 2020, uh, but I still think it's just a really cool application of where these topological tools can come into play in real world problems. So the goal, we were working with atmospheric scientists on this project um, who are interested in looking at this geostationary operational environmental satellite infrared imagery, uh, which is quite a mouthful, but essentially what we're looking at is uh, the satellite will detect the energy that's being emitted from the earth. And it has some, uh, representation of the temperature of the clouds or of the earth in that region. 
And so in this case, this is Hurricane Felix from 2007. Uh, and this is one particular image on September 2nd of 2007, but we have a time series of images that occur every hour here um, over the course of several days. And so you can see features of the hurricane changing. We still have this sort of spiral shape in the middle. One thing to note is that this hurricane actually hit land on September 4th, and you can kind of see the structure of the hurricane changing where we're getting more sort of dispersed patterns in the temperature. So that's just kind of a cool um, way to see something that happened in uh, the storm, but we can also see it just from looking at the images. And I should also mention that typically when we see these videos on the news, we see the hurricane moving over land geographically. But here we're not so much interested in the features relative to the geographic location, we're more interested in features in the storm itself. So these images are storm centered, where the center of the hurricane is always in the center of the image. So it's almost like we're moving our camera with the hurricane over time. So uh, that's the, the sort of starting data we have. And the atmospheric scientists that we were working with uh, are interested in what's called the tropical cyclone diurnal cycle or the TC diurnal cycle. And this is a cycle that occurs in most major hurricanes uh, on a daily basis. Um, they believe it has some sort of implication for the structure and intensity of the hurricane, although it's a feature of storms that's still uh, sort of being investigated to figure out what exactly it means. But um, when we were collaborating with them, one thing uh, they were one goal was just how do we detect whether a hurricane has this cycle or not to further figure out sort of what correlations can we make between what actually happened with the storm and did the storm have this cycle present or not. And so this particular cycle can be seen as a cooling ring that starts towards the middle of the storm and propagates away from the storm over time. And this repeats on a daily basis. One thing to note is this is a cooling ring, not a cold ring. So it's a change in temperature where there's some ring in the hurricane. We're in that region, the temperature is dropping faster than anywhere else in the hurricane. So in order to detect that, we need to take two images of a hurricane at different times and look at how the hurricane or the temperature changed in between. So in this case on the right, this is a figure from a paper from Dunyan et al. in 2014. Um, and this is examples of two uh, screenshots of the hurricane six hours apart and subtracted, and then take another six hours and subtract those two. So on the left, this would be 7.15 subtracting six hours later, and the right is 1.15 p.m. subtracting six hours later. So this tells us sort of how it's changed over time. And you can see that cooling ring now appears as a higher uh, intensity feature in our image. So earlier on, we see a smaller ring, while later on, we see a much, uh, the ring has sort of expanded and moved away from the storm. So this is the general feature that we're looking to detect is uh, a sort of region close to the middle of the storm that propagates away and then, then eventually will disappear. And the next day it starts over and expands again. The method that atmospheric scientists have taken in the past, um, in particular in this paper, was to, these images are centered. So center around the center of the image, these concentric disks that you can kind of see as dotted black lines in the image. And so these ones are at uh, radii of about hundred kilometers. And then what they do is take an average of all of the values or all of the pixels in that ring move to the next ring, calculate the average, and do this for every image in over time. Then what you can do is look at for a particular ring, how did that average temperature change? And that would sort of tell you was the this bright ring in that chosen concentric ring or not to be able to detect sort of how this uh, cycle is changing. And this is again, another figure from the Dunyan et al paper uh, plotting what that average brightness temperature is for one particular given ring. So this was in the 400 kilometer ring. And we can see that for 12 different hurricanes here uh, in ranging years from 2003 to 2010, we get this sort of periodic behavior where when the average is high, that would mean that 
the cycle is in that chosen 400 kilometer ring. When it's low, it's not. So we are seeing that over time that the cycle is in the chosen ring and then it moves out of it. And then the next day it moves back in and so on. And so they do detect this in a lot of these major hurricanes. There are, of course, some issues that we as mathematicians can nitpick here in terms of, you know, how do you choose that 400 kilometer radius? How do you determine what the right radius is, what the right ring size is, um, all sorts of different features. And so while it works fairly well in practice, it seems there are a lot of choices that uh, maybe aren't the easiest to make or might require some uh, expert knowledge to make. So our goal was, can we sort of recreate this idea of detecting this periodic pattern, but using a more automated approach uh, using tools from topological data analysis. And so we started with two different data sets. Uh, both of these are from Hurricane Felix in 2007. I know that feels like a lifetime ago at this point, uh, but that was the, the starting data we had. And so the two different data sets are from the same storm, but have different features. So the first data set uh, we had images taken every hour, but we were missing two hours of the day because as in real life, uh, data is imperfect and actually the satellite would go out of range and not be able to see the storm. So it couldn't record uh, the temperature for those chosen times. And so we also had for that particular data set uh, about three days worth of data and fairly high resolution, high detailed images. So this is sort of uh, an ideal data set in the time and spatial resolution, but we don't have a whole lot of days worth of data. The other data set, we have a longer time period. So we have a week's worth of data, but we only have images taken every three hours. So uh, varying resolution in both the spatial and time components across these two different data sets. And our goal was kind of to see if we can detect the cycle in both of these data sets. Well, first, can we do it in even one of them? But if so, if we can do it in both, then that sort of tells us how much information or how much data we need or how good quality of data we need in order to detect this uh, in future approaches or for future hurricanes. So as I mentioned, this cycle can be seen as a changing, uh, a cooling ring. So as I said, we have to take this six hour difference uh, in order to detect the ring-like structure. And now we can see for this particular time, we see this really bright yellow ring here where there's a high change in temperature where that cooling ring is showing up. We did choose the six hour time difference. You could look at other hours, like what, how does the temperature change over the course of three hours? But our atmospheric scientist collaborators had said that six hours was sort of their um, the best that they had found for detecting this. So we went with the prior knowledge and uh, chose what they looked at. We also looked at it for three hours and it didn't really vary that much, um, but we'll stick with six hours just for the sake of this uh, application. And so if we watch, now this is the video I showed at the beginning where we're looking at how, oops, sorry, technical difficulties. Um, this not a video, maybe I didn't make it a video, my bad. Um, so we earlier on, I showed the video of the uh, sort of changing temperature or the changing six hour difference where we could see that ring structure propagating over time. And so one way to detect circular features and images is using a tool that uh, in the seminar, we're all probably pretty familiar with, but I will uh, discuss briefly for anyone new to this area. Um, so we'll use persistent homology on these images. And in particular, we'll look at sub-level set persistence, where we look at, for an image, take all of our pixels with pixel value below a certain value. So in this case, we may be at around 0.5 or 0.6. We're looking at all of the pixels in this example image on the left that has a pixel value below that. And we look at what circular features are present. So on the right, we have the one dimensional persistence diagram where we're looking at, uh, at what pixel value is a circular feature born or does it first appear? And at what pixel value does a feature disappear or die? And so in this case, we'll have three different circular features in our image corresponding to 
this sort of smaller circle, smaller circle on the bottom right, the larger circle in the middle, and then there's sort of a smaller noisy circle that will appear. And so we look as we change this threshold, how um, these features change. So we can see that this one is born fairly early. This circle is born, but then quickly fills in. And then both of these circles sort of last the longest. And one uh, interpretation of persistence diagrams that isn't always correct, but in this case, um, it will work well for us is that points that are further from the diagonal, meaning they have a longer lifetime, will be considered more important or more prominent since they represent features that live longer or are uh, larger in the data set. So that's the primary tool that we'll use in this case. Okay, oh, here's my video. So uh, we start with this sort of original image data, and then we can look at how this ring-like feature changes. And so you can imagine at each snapshot in time, we can determine is there a ring-like feature using persistent homology is there a, a one-dimensional persistence point that has a long lifetime? Um, and that would sort of tell us the general size or prominence of that ring-like structure at that point in time. However, uh, the easy thing, of course, never works with real data. So we have this original image here where we have visually, we can all see this really bright yellow ring. Um, but if we were to take the persistent homology of this one image, we end up with a whole lot of noise. So whether we're doing sub-level set, super-level set, uh, whatever we're doing, here we have really bright regions with really high pixel values that are broken up by these regions in between with really low pixel values. So in this case, um, it's not we're not picking up those features that we want in our persistence diagram. So we have to make a few changes. So we start with this six-hour difference here. And then what we do is threshold the image. So in this case, we chose a threshold of 80. I'll come back to that later on. Um, but now we have all of the pixels that have a value above 80 are white and below 80 are black. From there, now we have a binary image. And looking at uh, this, we still don't have a circular feature formed. So what we do is use what's called the distance transform, where for every black pixel, you compute the distance to the closest white pixel and then assign it that value. So if you are on a white pixel, your distance to the closest white pixel is zero. And then the further you move away from that white region, the higher your distance value will be. So when we compute that distance transform, we get an image that looks like this, where the regions that are close to that ring have a low distance or a low function value. And then further out, you get the sort of dispersed uh, appearance. And so now the intuition, uh, that we have that there's that ring like feature will show up more easily in the persistence diagram since now we have this whole ring with a more similar function value. Uh, so the sub level set persistence will work uh, more the way we want it to. And so now we can look at rather than having a time series of those six hour difference images, we have a time series of the distance transform and we can watch how the persistence diagram changes over time. So at first we see a ring here and a one dimensional persistence point that's sort of rising off of the uh, diagonal. So a point with a larger lifetime, but then it disappears. Now we're getting a lot of noise, but now we see that feature sort of reappearing, rising up with an increased lifetime and then eventually dropping back down. So we are seeing this sort of periodic pattern of a one dimensional persistence point representing that circular feature appearing, getting larger, disappearing, and then starting over the next day. So we, in order to measure this, we did um, the fairly simple thing of looking at the maximum persistence value. So taking the lifetime of all of these points and computing their distance from the diagonal and taking the maximum. So that will give us sort of the size of the largest feature. And when we plot that over time, here the dark blue and dark red lines are what we wanna look at um, for those two different data sets of varying resolution. Uh, here, the gray lines represent uh, separate days, and the y-axis here is that maximum persistence. And so we see that for each day, we get this sort of rise and fall of our maximum persistence point over the course of each day. And while we only have a limited amount of data for the red higher resolution data set, we do see fairly similar patterns. And while their uh, maximum persistence values may not line up exactly, at least the 
the um, pattern is still there in both of them. And what we did to measure the periodicity of this is use the discrete Fourier transform. And when we do that, we end up with a period of approximately 24 hours in each one of these um, data sets. And so then using that uh, frequency for the uh, most prominent uh, sinusoidal pattern from the Fourier transform, we can reverse engineer what that time series would look like if that was the only frequency we had, which gives us these dashed lines. And so this is reconstructing just using that 24 hour period. And we can see that it matches pretty well. It's of course not perfect, but real world data never is. So it's about as best as we can hope for under the circumstances. So it's a really nice uh, sort of process here where we can start with our input images and end up getting that same 24 hour cycle that our atmospheric scientists collaborators were telling us should still be there. We also, of course, tested this for another hurricane. So it worked well in Hurricane Felix. We also looked at Hurricane Ivan, which was another one our atmospheric scientist collaborators were interested at the time. Uh, this is from 2004, so even longer ago, uh, but we're still getting that 24 hour cycle. So it does seem that this method is robust across different resolutions of data, and it works in at least two different hurricanes, which is always a good uh, test. One thing I mentioned is that we did have to choose that threshold. So we chose a threshold of 80. And in uh, we tested multiple different thresholds just to see how robust is our method to this choice of threshold. And so this is that same maximum persistence versus time plot for each of the three data sets, two from Hurricane Felix and one from Hurricane Ivan uh, for multiple different thresholds. And so for these two, which are the two higher resolution data sets, we can see that regardless of the threshold we've chosen in this range, we're still getting a very periodic pattern. So the data is still, um, or the method is still working fairly well, regardless of the threshold we chose, if we're in that, in this case, at least 80 to 100 range. In the lower resolution data set, it's a bit messier as can be expected since lower resolution data typically has less features. Um, but it did turn out that there was at least a range of threshold values where we were getting the same uh, periodicity in between. So I think, I don't remember the exact range off the top of my head anymore, but I think it was somewhere in the 75 to 85 uh, range where we were getting that same pattern. So while there, it might not work for every threshold, at least it's not, we didn't cherry pick one particular threshold that works and nothing else does. There are a range of values here that work. So it does require some sort of tuning or some choice, but it's at least slightly robust to that choice. Okay, so before I go on, I'll move on to the uh, next application. Before I go on though, are there any questions on the hurricane stuff? I'm happy to come back to it later on, but um, just if anyone has questions now. Okay. Well, if anyone has questions on that, uh, we can come back to it. But the next application is uh, slightly less pretty pictures, I will say. I love the hurricane pictures. But uh, now looking at change in structure um, in uh, dynamical systems and bifurcations. And here, rather than using regular persistence, we'll use zigzag persistence. So different tools, different applications, but uh, sort of similar underlying theme. So before we had the changing behavior where we had the cycle in the hurricane that was changing over time, now we have a different type of changing behavior where, as I mentioned at the beginning, we might have a time series where we're tuning some parameter and depending on that parameter choice, we're getting different behavior. So this is just a, that simple example again, if, if we're changing the amplitude of a noisy time series, we can see on either end of this sort of range of amplitude values, the periodic behavior is not super obvious relative to the noise. The noise sort of outweighs that periodic behavior. But once you get in the middle, you're seeing that range of uh, range of time series where you're getting that repeated periodic pattern. And so our goal was sort of to see, can we determine what range of values we might be getting or what range of time series we might be getting similar features or when does something drastically change? And so, just taking a step back, um, a reminder from persistent homology, typically what we look at in regular persistent homology 
before I talked about images, but we can also work with point clouds where we add connections between points in our point cloud um, based on their distance, uh, increase that distance and add more connections. And we see how the uh, structure of our simplicial complex changes over time. And so this comes down to having a collection of simplicial complexes with inclusions. Those inclusions uh, induce maps on the homology groups. And from there, we can get our persistence diagrams. So that's the what's underlying the sublevel set persistence and are, in this case, the standard via torus rips persistence. But it's hard to apply that when you have more than one point cloud. So we could look at, uh, this is just an, an example set of point clouds. We could look at the persistent homology using the via torus rips complex of each one of these, but then trying to add connections in between multiple persistence diagrams uh, can be tricky. So if we had a different persistence diagram for each one of these, how do we say, well, this circular feature is probably the same circular feature over here, but just expanded a little bit uh, based on their persistence points. Uh, persistent homology is also computationally expensive, as we all know. So trying to compute persistent homology for a bunch of different point clouds uh, can be limiting in computation. So what we'll do instead is look at zigzag persistence, where now we have some flexibility in that our inclusions don't have to all go in one direction. Our inclusions can go in different directions. So for example, they can alternate where we have one that's included into the next and then one that's included backwards. These maps still um, induce maps on the homology groups, and we can still calculate our zigzag persistent uh, diagram, where now we're capturing features between these uh, between these point clouds or simplicial complexes, rather than in just one growing simplicial complex. We allow things to be removed or added over time. So as a simple example, using zigzag persistence, we wanted to see, can we detect a range of point clouds that are most circular in some sense? So here we have five point clouds, but on either end, we have a fairly small circle, whereas in the middle here, it looks like we could take the orange circle, just shrink it a little bit and get the green one, shrink it a little bit more and get the red one. And then in between sort of those end ones, there's a more drastic change. So our goal is to see, well, these three features or these three point clouds are more similar than either end. So can we detect that range to say this is a, an important feature that's changing or that feature disappears when it appears and disappears, sorry. Okay, so setting up our zigzag, if we have an ordered collection of point clouds, we can define a set of inclusions by just taking the union of those point clouds in the middle and get this alternating zigzag. So those five different circles I showed on the last slide can be thought of as our five different uh, initial X's and then take their unions. So picture version, just stack those point clouds on top of each other. Uh, here the colors correspond so you can sort of see that change and again it becomes more obvious looking at these unions that here that's quite a big jump to get from blue to orange if we're thinking about this as just changing some parameter but in here these changes are fairly slow getting between orange and red so it's a fairly sim uh, similar feature but of course the, uh, looking at the homology of point clouds isn't uh, really interesting so instead what we do is compute the via torus rips complex of each one of these point clouds individually and then those inclusions still hold um, on the via torus rips of the union and so uh, we can do this for one fixed radius across our entire uh, set of point clouds we could also adapt this where each original point cloud can have a different radius and then you just have to choose the maximum here to make sure these those inclusions hold and when we do that for our particular example, we can see that here we have a circular feature on the end, uh, but when it's included in with the orange one, sort of all important information disappears. We just end up with all those edges added. But when we go from orange to the union back to green, we can see that circular feature still persists through this sort of middle range of the zigzag, and then it fills in again on the end. So, uh, at least visually, we can see where that circular feature occurs through this sequence or through this zigzag. So zigzag persistence diagrams have a slightly different interpretation uh, from regular persistence diagrams. So rather than it representing something about the scale of birth and death in a given point cloud, 
Instead, it represents the birth and death through this sequence. So for example, uh, this simple five circles, visually we might say that this is where our circular feature is apparent or the most similar through a point set of point clouds. And this corresponds to in our zigzag persistence diagram, the birth would be the index of our point cloud where that feature is born and our death is the index where it disappears. So here we have a birth at one since it's born at this X one point cloud and it dies at 3.5 since it dies in that union between three and four. So the interpretation is uh, different where now our birth and death represent sort of through the sequence of point clouds rather than just the uh, scale of the radius in the viator serps complex or um, the like value of the sublevel set parameter. Okay, so I said this was gonna relate to time series stuff. So where does the time series come in? So again, we can have some sort of set of starting time series where maybe we're running an experiment and uh, we wanna see how that experiment uh, impacts our, or how that parameter in our experiment um, impacts the end of the experiment or it impacts the result. So for a simple example, again, let's just start with these noisy sine waves and we can get to that set of point clouds by using uh, what's called the time delay embedding. So the time delay embedding of a time series looks at uh, that reconstruction into a higher dimensional space. So you can start with a time series of uh, just discrete values. Then you have to choose two parameters, the dimension and the lag, and the time delay embedding gives you a tuple in D dimensional space for whatever your uh, dimension is of time series points that are spaced tau apart. So I find this easier to understand uh, in an example. So for a given time series on the left here, what we do is we've chose to embed into two dimensions. So on the right, we'll see that two dimensional space. And we look at two points along our time series that are spaced tau units apart on the x-axis. And then we see, we take those y coordinates uh, or time series values to give us a tuple in, the, in R2 in this case. And then we see if we were to move those points along the time series, each one of those movements gives us a new point in our point cloud. And we can see that moving through this periodic time series gives us a circular feature in our point cloud. So in this case, um, in this simple example, this is uh, getting from our time series to our point clouds. And the time delay embedding, if you're not familiar with it, is a really powerful tool um, in the, the dynamical systems literature. So uh, coming from the work of Tawkins and Whitney. So just as a little bit of proof of why this is so cool, we can start with um, a full, uh, a full uh, dynamical system. So let's look at the Lorenz dynamical system, just for an example. And this is the famous uh, Lorenz butterfly, but here we have full knowledge of our system. What if we don't have full knowledge when we're doing an experiment, typically we can only measure one or two things. We don't know all of the uh, sort of variants that are going into something. So let's say we forget all of the information from our Lorenz attractor except the X coordinate over time. So now we've lost two thirds of the information from this plot getting to a time series. If we use the time delay embedding on this time series, uh, we're able to reconstruct this set of points. And while it may not match exactly to the original attractor, it has the same topological features. It still has these two loops. So we're still getting that butterfly shape just sort of stretched a little bit. So this is a really powerful tool because the underlying theory guarantees that uh, the new uh, collection of points from our time delay embedding is topologically equivalent to the underlying attractor. So we are preserving the important information even though here we only have one third of the original information. Okay, so back to our noisy sine waves, we can get our collection of points through just doing a time delay embedding of each one of these time series. We of course have to embed into the same dimension to make sure that this is something that makes sense. It's hard to compare point clouds across different dimensions. Um, so here we now have this same sort of sequence of point clouds as I was showing for our more synthetic example a few slides ago. And then we can set up our zigzag where this picture is a little hard to look at, but 
essentially we want to look through the rows of this is our rips complexes of the original point clouds and unions alternating and we can see that we get a circular feature sort of starting at x1 that feature continues through this middle region and eventually closes once we get to the end and our uh, zigzag persistence diagram tells us that exact thing, that we have a birth time of one, so our feature is born at X1, and it dies at 7.5, so it dies in that last union between seven and eight. And visually, this is what we would say, that we see a circle appearing at X1 and going through X7, and when we were looking at the time series, we could see that's when that periodic pattern was prominent, whereas on the end, the noise sort of outweighed that um, periodic information. So now I've given you two very synthetic examples, but let's look at a real dynamical system and see how this method works. So in particular in dynamical systems, there's a type of bifurcation or a type of uh, change in your system that can occur called a hop bifurcation. And this in particular looks like when you tune some parameter. So in this case, let's our parameter is B, when you tune some parameter, you can go from having a stable sort of uh, solution where you're staying in one point to all of a sudden you're uh, moving in a, this periodic pattern around a limit cycle. So you can go from having in a, just visually or topologically, we think of just a collection of points really close together to this circular collection of points. So um, the, this here is from the Selkov model for glycolysis. So this is a uh, model from biochemistry, which I do not know much of the biology about, but it's a sort of typical example that people study when they look at hop bifurcations. And so it's a two-dimensional system given by these two equations here on the left. And what we did is fix one of the parameter values in the system. So in particular, we fixed the parameter A and then varied the parameter B to see how does our system or our solution change uh, for different values of B. And so that's what's shown on the right here is this, uh, the solution in the X and Y coordinates um, over different parameter values of B. But as I mentioned before, in real world experiments, we often don't know all of the sort of underlying uh, variables that we have in an experiment. Typically, we might be only be able to measure one thing at a time. So what we did to sort of mimic that is what if we forget the y coordinates and now we only keep those x coordinates. So the same thing that I said with the Lorenz system, we've lost half the information, but it mimics a more real world example where maybe we're only tuning one parameter at a time and we only have sort of one variable that we're measuring over time. And so this is that corresponding set of time series where now we've forgotten the Y coordinates and we just have what is that X coordinate changing over time. And so again, we can then use our time delay embeddings to embed into two dimensional space. And we can see that we reconstruct those sort of circular features. Now they're more triangular shape, but still topologically a circle. And um, we've uh, sort of retained that same information, even though we forgot half of the original time series data. So now we can uh, use this as our starting set of point clouds. Compute the zigzag. Again, looking across the rows here, we see a circular feature appearing at around uh, X2, persisting through this middle range until X8. And you may notice these point clouds look a little bit more sparse than the ones on the past slide. We did do some subsampling for computational reasons um, because you are getting such uh, repetitive patterns of just going around the same circle multiple times. So we subsampled the points to capture the shape without needing all of the data. Then when we compute our zigzag persistence, uh, we end up with a birth time of two and a death time of 8.5. And so remember that that corresponds to the index. So this maps back to uh, this range of point clouds shown in red, where we have a feature that is born at around B of 0.45, persists through this collection of point clouds, and then dies in the union between 0.75 and 0.8. So visually, that's exactly what we would expect. And it turns out in comparison uh, for this particular system for the set of parameters we chose, it's known that the system has a hop bifurcation or has this behavior where a circular feature appears from 0.4 to uh, around 
So we're picking up pretty close to that region uh, that we know analytically from the dynamical systems literature, we know what parameter values we should be getting uh, that help bifurcation for, and we're getting pretty close. And you can imagine if we did a more fine grain discretization of our B values, we probably would get even closer. Here we took jumps of 0.05, we could get even smaller and maybe pick up more patterns in between or more features in between. One more application where this tool could be potentially useful is in uh, change point detection. So maybe you have just one time series, but there's some something that's occurring that's causing the behavior of your time series to change. So here we have uh, a just again a noisy sine or cosine wave, but where our amplitude at some point gets sort of blown up and then shrinks back down. And so you could use the same sort of approach where uh, if you did the time delay embedding of this original time series you end up with a point cloud with no discernible features, even though we can all see a sort of periodic pattern there. But if you break up your time series into smaller windows, you can study sort of the localized behavior of these time series um, using the zigzag persistence, where you would pick up sort of a more circular feature or a more prominent circular feature in this middle range than on either end. So maybe that drastic change in amplitude represents something important in your system. And your goal would be to detect sort of when does that blow up of your uh, amplitude occur. And so here the zigzag persistence would tell us that it starts around here, our second point cloud, and dies in between uh, the fourth and fifth point clouds. So just another application where this could be used outside of bifurcation detection. So overall, we called this the buzz method, the bifurcation using zigzags method, where you can start with an input of a collection of time series, compute the time delay embeddings, uh, create a zigzag of the RIPS complexes, and then use zigzag persistence to capture or summarize all of the information in your collection of point clouds or all of your topological information. One thing is that you also could alter this method. And while our interests in particular started with looking at time series data, you could forget this first step and just start with any collection of point clouds that might be changing in some ordered way uh, in order to study the changing structure. So one application that we've always had in mind, but have never uh, actually applied this to is there's other work in TDA that looks at sort of swarms or uh, flocks of birds moving over time. And so you could detect how if you have a sequence of sort of images of locations of birds or swarms, you could see how does the structure change as these birds are moving over the course of time. So you could start with any sort of collection of point clouds that uh, is either changing with respect to some parameter or some time evolving and uh, capture the structure using zigzag persistence. So this method is beneficial um, in that it uh, bypasses the computation of numerous persistence diagrams. So we don't have to look at what the persistence is of each one of these individual point clouds. We don't have to do anything with uh, looking at sort of optimal cycle representatives and stuff like that to make connections. Uh, and we're just able to use zigzag persistence to capture all of this information in one persistence diagram. And uh, we've shown that this method works in numerous synthetic examples as well as in an example dynamical system. So it seems promising in uh, that it could be useful in different contexts. I, uh, of course, want to be transparent and also mention the uh, sort of cons of this method. So no method is perfect, right? Um, the some of the cons are that the time delay embedded point clouds get large the longer you have, uh, for the longer time you have. And so we fixed this by subsampling. Um, but RIPS complexes are also expensive to compute. And the one thing that I uh, conveniently glossed over was choosing the radius for the RIPS complex of all of these things. So uh, right now we don't have a nice way to do this other than uh, with some initial eyeballing and tuning. Um, but in theory, there might be other ways to choose this more carefully. So as a brief wrap up, um, we looked at hurricanes and a method of automatically detecting uh, this cycle in hurricane imagery. And our method was robust to spatial and temporal resolution of the imagery. It worked on two hurricanes and is robust uh, to a couple of different things, the threshold and noise in the imagery, which I didn't really mention earlier. And the buzz method is our uh, one-step method uh, to capturing the topological structure in multiple different uh, point clouds or time series data.
So I'll end with a thank you to my fabulous uh, PhD advisor, Liz Munch, who was my collaborator on both of these projects. Uh, Dr. Frosca Sone was our collaborator on the dynamical systems paper, and we had three atmospheric scientist collaborators uh, from University at Albany on the hurricane project. Uh, so these are the two corresponding papers and uh, my contact info. So please feel free to reach out with any questions in the future. And for now, I'm happy to answer anything you all have online. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Before we go to the questions, let's please all unmute ourselves and then we can get together for, for Sarah. Thank you. Great, thanks. So does anyone have a question? Maybe go ahead and ask one. Oh, Henry, Henry, I see. You're already yeah, I'll, your I'll start with a question. Um, Sarah, if you don't mind going to slide 33 or so. 33, sure. There we go. Back here. Right. Yeah, so is it the case that sort of um, in this transition from B equals 0.4 to 0.45 and similarly from 0.75 to 0.8, there, there are known um, hop bifurcations? Yeah, so in the uh, dynamical systems literature studying these types of bifurcations, uh, the methods that they use can tell them that uh, the bifurcation occurs in this range. And so here you have uh, sort of a spiraling behavior in your dynamical system, whereas here you end up with a limit cycle where you're getting that circular pattern. And this in between is that transition or that bifurcation. And so while the dynamical systems literature has a lot of ways of measuring these things when you know the underlying equations or at least can approximate the underlying equations, if uh, you're doing this from a data-driven perspective, it doesn't uh, the, those methods don't quite carry over. So our goal was to sort of an equationless method of doing this. How do we just detect these patterns from data itself? Mm -hmm. and, and for this example, are those probably the only two bifurcations in this range? Yes. Or, yeah. So um, it occurred, the bifurcation when we go from that sort of spiral to a limit cycle and then the limit cycle back to the spiral and stable behavior. But, but in general, just given the pictures... Mm -hmm. I mean, as you're saying, or just given the data, in general, it's a difficult challenge to say where the bifurcations are. Right, yeah. And in practice, these bifurcations can be detrimental to your experiments. So the sort of underlying application that's always been in mind for these is uh, work that Liz and Faras have done previously on uh, chatter detection in mechanical systems. So if you have uh, some mechanical system where you're cutting some surface with a cutting tool, these bifurcations can represent uh, when that cutting tool starts to sort of like get jolted. So if you imagine like, uh, you know, cutting um, Christmas paper, sometimes the scissors like slide nicely and then all of a sudden they start like chattering a lot and sort of get those jagged cuts in Christmas paper. That's sort of my uh, non-mechanical engineer version of chatter where you go from this nice smooth, you can imagine cutting a surface and you're cutting it nice and smoothly but then if you do something wrong, now you're uh, chattering and cutting it in a weird pattern. And that can be damaging to both what you're cutting and the tool you're cutting it with. So the idea of doing this in a data-driven manner is if you're doing this cutting process and our method is able to detect that, oh, you've hit a, you know, a, a spot of chatter where this bifurcation occurs or the circular feature appears, you can sort of shut down your system and say like, we don't want to go any further. We don't want to cause any more damage. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is by Dave Damiani. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Hi. Enjoyed the talk. Thank How you. are you doing? Good, good, thanks. Uh, okay. So here's a question. Have you done yes. any examples where the attractor is two, has two-dimensional homology? No, we haven't. Uh, that would be very interesting for sure. Um, we haven't gone beyond this one dimensional structure, but yeah, it would be really cool to be able to detect other things as well. It's, uh, I think there's a lot of different directions we could take this work, of course, graduating uh, <laughs> and starting a new job always disrupts uh, those sort of things. So <laughs> ideally I'd love to get back to it at some point, but that's a great question. Well, good, thanks. Mm -hmm. 
any more? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good, yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. My question is uh, on page 12. Can you please uh, a bit yeah. explain page 12? Yeah. Yes. Let me go back. Sorry. Yes, I think I, I missed something there. Yeah, when you are talking about uh, average, the maximum persistence. How do you oh, obtain yeah. it? So maximum persistence is computed for, in our persistence diagram, we have these birth and death values. And one yeah. thing you can do is look at the death minus the birth time, which tells you the lifetime of that point, essentially. And what that represents uh, visually in a persistence diagram is the distance from that point to the diagonal. Yeah. So looking at the maximum persistence sort of tells you how large is your largest feature. So that's what you use for the for the next page. Is that what you use? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So here, this is that maximum yeah. persistence value plotted over time. Okay. For so the time is for each uh, like persistence. Sorry, for each image. Mm -hmm. You look at yeah, the maximum so we have persistence that. and you look at the time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. So look at what that maximum persistence value is at each one of those images through time. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and the other one is with regards to zigzag uh, zigzag persistence. Yeah. My question is: uh, Does it only uh, work only on a set of or sequence of uh, point clouds that has like a kind of order? Uh, so I see it moves from like something like that is like a point up to a bigger cycle, then it goes down to a point. Yeah. So in theory, it doesn't just have to be points going to circles, um, but you do have to have, in this case, you have to have some sort of ordering on your system. So the uh, ordering that we had was that, you know, we have some order of our original point clouds. We need a way to relate them in the middle. So we look at their union, um, but you may have a different context where you have a different type of relationship between each one of those steps. And the nice thing about zigzag persistence is you can uh, change these inclusions. It doesn't have to just be uh, this alternating pattern. You could have inclusions going in different directions at different times, um, but there, there does have to be some sort of uh, ordering oh, to start with. That's, that's my question. Thank you very yes. much. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thanks. Any more questions? And maybe one more question about the choosing the radius. Um, so you said that uh, it's not so obvious how to choose the radius, but you somehow um, did. Like, like, also, when you say the probably it's rather the radii, not the radius. You choose for every step a different radius. Um, so did you have some uh, heuristic of how would be a reasonable approach to choose the radius, or was it really just like manually looking at it? Uh, so. Uh we don't have a heuristic at this point in time. Uh, in this particular example here, we did use this sort of different radius for each one, but in the other two uh, applications, these ones, we used the same radius. So it was only just one choice we had to make. In practice, that's probably what you'd wanna do. Otherwise it's a little bit too hand-tuned to choose a different radius for each one. Um, at least that's would be my thought. So. Here, yeah, we looked at the collection of point clouds and sort of the scales and distances between points to figure out what might be the right thing to choose. Um, but we, we don't have like a heuristic written down or anything, um, but at least it, yeah, it, it was just one choice in these last two cases, so. Yeah, I'd be curious if there's like something like, I don't know that, um, you have these nice circles in these examples usually, so that probably there's one radius where this circle appears for the first time. So maybe one could even come up with some heuristic of like um, the first radius where a big feature pops up or I don't know. I know. So yeah, that's, we had that thought at one point too of like, well, you could look at the persistent homology of each one of these point clouds and see, you know, what radius does that circle appear? But then that sort of, you know, it gets computationally heavy. Yeah, and defeats the point of like skipping over all of that to use zigzag persistence. So, yeah, I'm sure there's probably something you could write down in terms of distances to, you know, figure out what might be close-ish to optimal. But uh, in general, it's not. Uh, we we didn't figure that out yet. 
Yeah, and it seems to work very well. Probably it's like overcomplicated thinking to try to somehow optimize it. Yeah, if you wanted to do it for like a, a larger scale experiment or something, it probably would be nice to have uh, more of a heuristic, but for the purposes of this sort of demonstrating that this method could be useful, uh, just, you know, a little bit of hand tuning worked out well. Yeah, sounds great. Okay, maybe one last question before we go to the um, before, before we end the recording. Okay, or maybe if there's no no urgent question anymore, then I'll end the recording here, and then people can still ask questions in the private part. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you.